Before we commence the election of a speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 4, Bar 2, I would like to invite Mr. Samuel Gardner to take the chair as acting speaker and preside over the election. Order members, the next item of business is the election of the Speaker. Before we commence, I would like to remind members that the election of the Speaker will be conducted using the procedures set out in Standing Order 4. In accordance with Standing Order 4 2, I have taken the Chair as Acting Speaker and will preside over the election. I will begin by asking for nominations. Any member may rise to propose and another member is elected as Speaker. I will then ask for the proposal to be seconded another member, as required by Standing Orders 14. In this, if this occurs, I will then verify that the member so nominated is willing to accept the nomination. There will not be an opportunity for speeches at this stage. I will then ask for further proposals and the following the same procedures for each. When it appears that there are no further proposals, I will make it clear that the time for the proposals has passed. If members indicate that they wish to speak, a debate relevant to the election may then take their place in which no member may speak more than once. At the conclusion of the debate, or the conclusion of the nominations, if there are no requests to speak, I will put the question that the member first proposed shall be Speaker of this Assembly. The vote can be only carried on a cross-community basis. If the proposal is not carried, I will put the question in relation to the next nominee and so on until all nominations are exhausted. If that is clear, we will proceed. Do I have any proposals? for the Office of Speaker for this Assembly. Good. Acting Speaker, I am honoured to nominate my friend and colleague uh, Mitchell McLaughlin for the position of Speaker. Mitchell and his wife uh, Mary Lou and I have been friends for 40 years and I know well the breadth of his uh, abilities, his, de his dedication. Sorry, could, could it draw your attention to just a nomination, not a speech at this stage? I am honoured to nominate Mitchell McLaughlin as Speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs> Could I have a seconder now? I Tim I second that. Are there any other nominations? I wish to nominate John Dallet. Mr. John Dallet has been proposed. A second it, Mr. Speaker. Seconded Mr. by Mr. Mrs. Kelly. <coughs> any other nominations? Yes, I nominate Mr. Roy Beggs. Does he will? Second. I second that nomination. Can you check that each are prepared to serve? Can you check that Mitchell McLaughlin is prepared? Is Mitchell McLaughlin prepared to serve, if elected? And who is Mr. John Dallet prepared to serve, if elected? And who is the other one? Mr. Roy Beggs prepared to serve, if elected? Thank you. Are there any other nominations? What page are we on? The time of, uh, for proposals has expired. A number of members have indicated that they may wish to speak. I would remind members that they may speak only once in the course of the debate and that the Business Committee has agreed to allow each member wishing to speak up to three minutes. And I call Mr Martin McGuinness on this occasion. As I was about to say, Mitchell... <laughs> <laughs> Mitchell and his wife Mary Lou and I have been friends for uh, 40 years and I know well the breadth of Mitchell's abilities, dedication and thoughtfulness of approach uh, to uh, the, uh, political life. Uh, I believe him to be well suited to fulfil the onerous responsibility of being Speaker uh, of this Assembly and what that entails. As a dairyman taking over from William Hay 
a Londonderry man. This represents yet another symbolic important step towards equality and inclusiveness. Uh, I want to pay tribute to William for the admirable way he represented this House and how fair and impartial his judgments uh, were. And I wish William uh, well in the future. I believe that Mitchell McLaughlin will, as William did, won the respect and admiration of the whole House. And I have no hesitation uh, whatsoever in uh, uh, nominating him as a new speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. I, I want to make clear, first of all, that there is no legal or constitutional requirement for a speaker to come from the constituency of FOIL, uh, though I, I'm sure that there is a, a recognition that there must be something special in the air uh, down there to have the proposals coming from that uh, constituency. Uh, I just remind the House that uh, when we previously looked at this issue back in September, uh, I uh, pointed out on behalf of my colleagues uh, that uh, a, an agreement that had been entered into, and let's remember, this is a, a House that won't have a Speaker unless there is an agreement, uh, particularly amongst the, the two main parties, and therefore would not operate uh, and function properly without it. Uh, we indicated that uh, we would honour uh, the agreement to uh, have a Sinn Féin nominee in that position when uh, Sinn Féin uh, had agreed on the issue of welfare reform. I'm pleased to, to say and to see that that has now happened. Uh, I therefore intend to, to honour uh, that agreement and to, to give support to uh, Mitchell McLaughlin. Uh, I say only one thing to, to him and to the, the House. Uh, I think uh, an example has been set by the outgoing uh, Speaker, uh, William Hay, soon to become uh, a Lord. Uh, and uh, I think everyone will recognise that uh, William, in the exercise of his duty, cut his connection from party politics while carrying out that role. And that is essential, and I make it clear that there should be uh, no party instructions to a speaker. Uh, the speaker must act uh, independently uh, in that office, and I trust that that is what will happen. Please. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. I, too, would want to pay tribute to the former Speaker, Willie Hay, for the tremendous job he did here. He was fair, he was impartial, he was dignified and he was inclusive. And he certainly took the role of Speaker and placed it outside party politics and in an independent space. But on the 30, 13th of October last, I was privileged to be able to speak on the nomination of John Dallet as Speaker of this Assembly. It was very clear then, and I am very clear now, that John is an outstanding choice for Speaker, and that is why we said put him for, his name forward as our nominee. As a Deputy Speaker, he has given this Assembly and its members exemplary service over the past seven years, showing leadership, integrity, impartiality and good judgment at all times. John has further shown his ability and capacity to take on the role of Speaker as and when required. I pointed out in October, and it is worth repeating now, that John Dallas' long and dedicated service to the Assembly has given him the wide and comprehensive experience of all the procedural and corporate functions of that office. At that time, I was disappointed to see that other parties allowed narrow party political self-interest to stand in the way of John's election. It would seem that little has changed. It would appear that the DUP and Sinn Féin have reconcocted their secret arrangements, a secret arrangement designed to exclude the rest of us in this Assembly. And in the light of those side deals and secret deals, and at a time when public confidence in this Assembly is at an all-time low, it is even more crucial to have someone of the calibre of John Dallet as Speaker. It is time we moved to an open and transparent system of government here, without backdoor deals or side deals, designed to shut out full inclusion and full democracy. Thank you. To make Nesbitt, please. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much indeed. As we conduct the first bit of business of 2015, I am sure many members uh, have aspirations for the next 12 months, maybe even uh, resolutions. Mine would certainly be that we move towards more 
normal politics. Uh, and in fairness, I think some strides were taken in that regard to the tail end of 2014 uh, during the storm at House talks, uh, balancing our budget and getting that right, uh, opposition, uh, and effective and efficient government being added to the inclusion uh, that was at the heart of the 1998 deal. But surely, normal politics uh, in a matter like this would be simply selecting the best man or woman for the job. Uh, and yet we see uh, to our left, from the largest single party, not a single candidate uh, considered uh, worthy of consideration by the House. So despite the Secretary of State's assurances that there were no side deals uh, at Stormont House, I commend the First Minister for admitting this was a side deal, uh, their support uh, for Mitchell McLaughlin. I'm sorry they don't feel they have anybody worthy of consideration. The Ulster Unionist Party does. Roy Beggs, we consider uh, to be a more than capable candidate. A man first elected to this chamber in 1998 and he's defended his seat at every assembly election uh, since then. So there's the first quality, loyalty. Uh, and there is no doubt uh, that the speaker has to demonstrate uh, a number uh, of values. Loyalty being one, a good temperament, uh, attention to detail, absolutely critical uh, in the role, and a sense of fairness and of fair play, all of which Roy Beggs uh, demonstrates abundantly. But of course, being Speaker isn't just about presiding over uh, the business of this chamber, or indeed ensuring that the business of the Assembly uh, is conducted smoothly. The Speaker is also the principal interface with civic society, uh, and Roy Beggs uh, has nothing to prove in that regard. So I have no difficulty and indeed great pleasure uh, in commending and recommending Roy Beggs to this okay. House. Mr. David Ford. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. I suspect you weren't imagining last autumn that you'd have to do the job twice, but I suppose today is probably a case of better late than never. Uh, can I join others, first of all, in paying my tribute again to William Hay and the role that he performed as Speaker? He did at least break the apparent constitutional requirement that the Speaker of this House should be a member of the Alliance Party, and for that uh, he must be thanked, as well as for the work that he did whilst he was in the Speaker's chair. But there is also a, a sad and interesting parallel that when Willie Hay was proposed, he was proposed as Speaker on a cross-community basis, and we still haven't reached that point yet today. When we last discussed the question of the Speaker, I made it very clear that Alliance will be supporting Mitch McLaughlin on two grounds. First of all, because when agreements are made, they should be honoured. And it shouldn't have required the Sinn Féin rollover over welfare reform to get the agreement on who should be Speaker of this House honoured. And the second point was because I do believe that Mitch McLaughlin has, as Principal Deputy Speaker, acted as an impartial way as any who have been Deputy Speakers of this House and who has shown that he was preparing himself to be an impartial speaker in the same way as William Hay was, in the same way as John Alderdice and Eileen Bell were in previous assemblies. And on that basis, I believe he should be supported for speaker today, not out of any disrespect for John Dallet or Roy Beggs, not out of suggesting that they're not fit to do, do the job, but because an agreement was reached, he has been acting as principal deputy speaker, and that should carry through. I also believe that if this House is to elect a Sinn Féin speaker today, it will actually make a very significant statement about people who have been at times reticent, fully buying into the institutions of this Assembly, and I think that is a fundamental, significant, important point which should not be lost on the wider community. And with that, I have great uh, pleasure in endorsing the member for South Antrim as Speaker of the House. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Acting uh, Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, uh, very pleased to uh, second uh, my party leader's proposal of Mr. Uh, John Dallet as Speaker of this House. John Dallet has many years uh, of political experience, and I think he's the longest serving member of uh, the Speaker's office. He has shown in the role of Deputy Speaker his impartiality and his ability to act above party politics. And uh, as the First Minister said, uh, we are here today with uh, the proposal for Mitch McLaughlin as a consequence of an agreement between uh, the two main parties. 
It would do members of this House well to remember, Mr Acting Speaker, that this House owes its existence to both the endorsement and the agreement of the people of this island for power sharing and partnership, not power carve-up between the two largest parties. And we in the SDLP remember well just a few months ago when Sinn Féin blocked the first Nationalist Speaker nomination of John Dallet to this House. Sinn Féin members had an opportunity to speak and to vote for a Nationalist Speaker of this House and voted ashamedly against it. So, unlike Sinn Féin, we hold higher principles and higher values, and the SDLP continues to rail against the power carve-up between the two main parties. So, Mr Speaker, we today will be supporting Mr Dallet with pride. Thank you. Mr Alex Atwood, please. Um, could I first of all say, uh, Mr Acting Speaker, that um, the SDLP believes that the three candidates, Mr Beggs, Mr Dallet, Mr McLaughlin, all have the capacity and could all have the confidence of this House when it comes to the role of Speaker. But I do want to repeat two comments that I made uh, when this matter came before the House last autumn in respect of our candidate, Mr Dallet. The Hansard um, record confirms that I said the following, quote, the election of the Speaker today can be a watershed moment. We should measure the next 10 minutes against whether or not it is a watershed moment for the Assembly and for politics. In the view of the SDLP, more than any other candidate, the election of John Dallet as Speaker would represent that watershed moment. The election of John Dallet would be a renewal of integrity and a recognition of a good public servant. Mm -hmm. I then added, Mr Deputy Speaker, for too long, issue after issue in the Assembly and in Northern Ireland has been reduced to narrow deals. It has been about the division of spoils rather than the full public interest. John Dallet, as Speaker, would represent something and someone different. And in the view of our party, those comments made four months ago are as valid today as they were then. And in respect to the latter point, it will be curious to see over these next number of days whether or not politics is again reduced to a division of spoils when it comes to the nomination of a principal deputy speaker of this House. I wait to hear the voices across this chamber in response to that particular question. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, on the last occasion, the SDLP voted for Mitchell McLaughlin as Speaker. And the Hansard records 14 SDLP votes for Mr McLaughlin and 24 for Sinn Féin. But the Hansard then records the following, Mr Deputy Speaker. It records under the leader of the Nationalist 24 people voting against a Nationalist Speaker of this House. Mr Boylan voted no, Mr Kelly voted no, Mr McElduff voted no, Ms McKillen voted no, Mr O'Dowd voted no. 24 nationalists, by their own declaration in the members' interests in this House, voted down the first nationalist speaker of this House. So when we come to exercise our vote, Mr Deputy Speaker, we won't follow that narrow, selective, partial, limited and backward example. Whilst we support John Dallet, we will not oppose Mr McLaughlin. Mr Jim Allister, please. Well said. Mr Acting Speaker, what we are seeing today, and will in a few minutes see, is the first down payment by the DUP to Sinn Féin arising from the Stormont House Agreement the delivery of this side deal. Three months ago, Mitchell McLaughlin was unelectable. As far as I'm concerned, he's still unelectable because he's still the same Mitchell McLaughlin, the Mitchell McLaughlin who, with great notoriety, told the general listening public that that most cruel of crimes, the kidnapping, the murder, the secret burial, of Jean McConville wasn't a crime. 
And yet, there are some in this house that thinks that someone of that mentality should be made speaker of this house. And the shame, of course, is that those unretracted remarks will mark the future speaker of this house as someone prepared to take that stance and put in that position by many of those who say they would abhor such comments. Of course, the position he aspires to, the chair, as it were, that he wants to sit on, was once occupied by Sir Norman Strong for more than two decades. What happened, Sir Norman Strong? Done to death, most cruelly, shot and incinerated by an IRA attack on his home. Was that a crime, one asked Mr. McLaughlin? Seems to some who are going to vote for him, they neither know nor care whether he thinks that was a crime. We know what his party president thinks of the murder of our previous speaker of this house, for he's on record as saying, the only complaint I have heard from nationalists or anti-unionists is that he was not shot 40 years ago. But it's someone of that ilk who thinks the murder of Jean McConville was not a crime, who now aspires to hold the position of speaker, courtesy of the votes from the DUP benches. There are some in the DUP who in the past have gone for a walk rather than vote for such matters. Today I suspect they're going to walk through the lobbies. Well, next time they walk past the memorial to Sir Norman Strong, may they hang their heads in shame. Gregory Campbell, please. Uh, thank you. The uh, position of speaker is a very important one, and I think the, some factual uh, accuracy should be put on the record. Mr. Speaker, if every unionist MLA in the chamber today were to vote for the only unionist candidate in the field, he would still not be elected. Um, in the past, whenever Sinn Féin have made wrong decisions and carried out wrong actions as part of the Republican movement, we in this party have attacked them and condemned them, and rightly so. That was is and remains our stance. We did it consistently when others walked away, and we will do it uh, today and in the future. And when they did the right thing, Mr. Speaker, we acknowledged that they had done the right thing. For example, for support for the police and the rule of law, we acknowledged that they had at long last, after many years, denying that and usurping that, that they had done the right thing. But then when they were reneged on that, such as the murder parade uh, in Castle Derg, we told them that they were wrong, we condemned them, and we said there would be repercussions. Again, on welfare reform, whenever we told them uh, and said to them that we had an agreement in private that they would implement welfare reform, and they were reneged on it, we said there would be repercussions. Thankfully, they have now moved from that position, from saying that they would not implement welfare reform they are now implementing it. So again, we acknowledge when they do the right thing, we condemn them when they do the wrong thing. Today, we both acknowledge in word and in deed whenever they have done the right thing. It is important, uh, Mr. Speaker, that people be quoted accurately in this chamber uh, today and in the future, so that, for example, uh, just over a year ago when the education minister in this chamber inaccurately quoted me about implementing power sharing, I uh, accurately rectified the matter, and I'm happy to do so again today. Um, whenever Jerry Adams, on his departure from this chamber, and he again inaccurately referred to some comments I allegedly had made, 
I had to rectify the position there again. Mr. Speaker, this party stands for progress. We stand uh, in order to try and ensure that we will make progress both now and in the future. And if Sinn Féin or the incoming Speaker, if he is elected, uh, were to uh, step out of line, we would condemn them. And of course, we now wait to see if all the necessary tests between now and the next Assembly election are passed. Okay. Mr. John McAllister, please. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Um, the role of a uh, Speaker of this House, indeed any in, our, in a parliamentary system that we have, is a hugely important uh, role to take up. Uh, I do hope that this is the last occasion, Acting Speaker, that we elect our Speaker this way, as, as many in this chamber will know. I would like to see that change. I would like to be very much uh, to be a gift of this House, of this Assembly, rather than uh, the result of, uh, of indeed actually done uh, seven, uh, nearly eight years ago. Um, I would like to see that separation. And I do think the First Minister's point about uh, Speaker Hay leaving his party affiliation behind, I think that's important that whoever is elected Speaker today, that that does happen. I think it's also important, and, and the way I would like to change it, that they leave also their constituency and all of the issues that they would have to deal with. I think that lifts the Speaker truly out of, if you like, the politics of every, uh, every day, of party politics and of constituency politics, whether that's writing about planning. And that's why I think changing the way and recognising that separation and the role of the Speaker is hugely important. The Speaker should be the champion for the back benches, for the work that, that this Assembly does, for making sure that ministers and the executive branch of government uh, is held to account. And I think that's why the role uh, is so, so important. And that's why I do hope that this is the last occasion we elect a, a speaker like this. As colleagues have said, I, and I agree with this point, that I would have no great difficulty in voting for any of the three candidates on offer today, as I voted for them uh, uh, on the last occasion that we did this. Uh, Mitchell McLaughlin, as a principal deputy speaker, certainly I, I feel has shown many of the, the characteristics that I would want to see in a speaker um, being Im impartial uh, and carrying out the duties. And I hope he will continue to do that if elected uh, today. I will uh, vote. I just hope, acting speaker, that we end up at the end of today with a speaker. Uh, and I think it is important that if Mr. McLaughlin is elected, that it does again signal the full buy-in of Sinn Féin into this institution, into this assembly. And I think that is an important point to acknowledge and to hope for. So I'm not uh, acting uh, Speaker. I will support Mitchell McLaughlin's nomination for Speaker. The question is that Mr. Mitchell McLaughlin be Speaker of this assembly. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against, no. 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 Clear the lobbies. Question in three minutes. I'm afraid we're going to have to clear the lobbies, and the questions will be put in three minutes.
Order members, would you please resume their seats? Would members please resume their seats? Would members please resume their seats? The question is that Mr. Michael Mitchell McLaughlin, the candidate first proposed, be Speaker of this Assembly. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Contrary, if any. No. no. Do we have tellers? Order, please. The tellers for the eyes are Mr. McCartan and uh, Ms. Ruan. Tellers for the nose, Ms. Dobson and Mrs. Overend. Clear the lobbies.
Could we have the doors secured, please? Secure the doors.
Order. Would members please resume their seats? Thank you. <coughs> Clark, please read the results. Order members, would you please resume their seats? Would members please resume their seats? Would members please resume their seats? The question is that Mr. Michael Mitchell McLaughlin, the candidate first proposed, be Speaker of this Assembly. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Contrary, if any. No. no. Do we have tellers? Order, please. The tellers for the eyes are 
Mr. McCartney and uh, Mr. Ryan. Tellers for the nose, Stopson and Mrs. Overend. Clear the lobbies. Could we have the doors secured, please? Secure the doors.
Order. Would members please resume their seats? Thank you. <coughs> Clark, please read the results. Point seven per cent. Twenty eight nationalists voted, of which twenty eight voted aye, a hundred per cent. Forty eight unionists voted, of which thirty six voted aye, seventy five per cent. And eight others voted, and eight voted aye, which is a hundred per cent. The motion is carried by cross community consent. I formally, I formally declare that Mr. Michael McGlock. Mitchell McLaughlin has been elected as Speaker of the House. You've been very patient there, so you can come with him. Order. And before we uh, move on with the other business, I'd just like to say a few words. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank Mr. Sam Gardner for serving the House by both presiding over the election of the Speaker today, as well as the dress rehearsal in October. I also want to express my sincere appreciation of the two Deputy Speakers, Roy Beggs and John Dallet, for the excellent working relationship we have had, particularly in recent months. The situation we found ourselves in had the potential to be a very difficult one, but we all approached it from the perspective of seeking agreement on the best interests of the House and its procedures, and I think that will serve us well in the time ahead. Since October, we have all gained a better understanding of the issues and the pressures that the Speaker has to manage. That insight has only served to strengthen my admiration for the service that Speaker Hay gave to this Assembly. It was regrettable that Speaker Hay did not have the opportunity to be here in person when he stepped down from the chair. And I know that members will wish him well now that his health has improved and he prepares to take his seat in the House of Lords. But I hope to have an early opportunity, and I know this will, uh, this will be endorsed by the Assembly itself, to invite Speaker Hay back to mark his major contribution to this Assembly. Finally, I want to thank minister, or members for their support today. And I would say to all members, those who supported me and those who did not, that I am conscious that I am here to uphold the impartiality and the independence of the office and the interests of this House on behalf of all of you. I know that there are times, as Speaker, when I will have to make judgments which will not please everyone, but I am also as focused on that and on what I might be able to do to help increase understanding and agreement both inside and outside this chamber. We are now, I believe, in a more positive political environment than we have been for a few years, and we have much work ahead to do. Like any debating chamber, this assembly symbolises the rights of members to discuss, to agree or to disagree, to decide on or to decide not to compromise. I look forward to the cooperation of all members to exercise these rights constructively and to show collectively what this place can achieve on behalf of all of our constituents. And order. The next item of business is a motion from point of order. I, I would request, Mr. Speaker, that she might review the, review the Hansard record, in particular the comments made by Mr. Alistair in relation to uh, comments made by a third party not in or a member of this chamber uh, in respect of the uh, attacks in Paris and France over the last number of days. I would ask that you review the Hansard uh, and determine whether or not uh, those comments were appropriate. Yeah, I, I will actually uh, review Hansard and uh, I will seek the uh, advice and counsel that's available to me as Speaker to see whether indeed an issue of such uh, did arise. Is it further that point of order or a new point of order? Uh, 
on a matter perhaps more relevant given the moment. Would it be in order to ask if the current Speaker of this House regards the murder of a predecessor as a crime? That is not a point of order, but let me take an early opportunity to mark the card of all members, including yourself. Do not abuse the procedures or I will respond appropriately. Order.